first we'll be hearing from uh, Dame Sally McIntyre and then uh, later on and, and after her from uh, Chris Whitty. So let me introduce Sally, who has been a leading light in the PRP programme and is chair of the Scientific Advisory uh, Board for PRP and also chair of the Expert Review Group, so has been very involved and is going to tell us something about the UK PRP vision and objectives. We'll be hearing more about the actual sort of nuts and bolts and details of the awards, but Sally will be telling us about the vision and objectives and focusing on that now. Sally, over to you. I always have to lower the microphone. Uh, I'd like to add my welcome. It's actually terrific to see you all in the room, and welcome to those who are uh, participating online as well. Um, what I'm going to do is give a brief outline of um, the UK PRP, its background, its objectives, and its focus. And as you know, as this is call two, I'm going to then go on in slightly more detail to talk about priorities for call two. Um, I would just remind you there is a vision document for the whole partnership which was published in May 2017 and there's also of course the document that launched this call too. So any potential applicants I would advise you very strongly to read both documents. So what's the background? So one of the bits of background is the recognition um, following on from an analysis of health spending, health research spending in the UK that prevention research, particularly primary prevention research, was very under-resourced. About 2.5% uh, of research funding into health uh, went into primary prevention in 2006. Um, so there's a well-known imbalance in research funding. The other issue is obviously the need to address the burden and costs of major non-communicable diseases in the UK and of course elsewhere. And by burdens we mean distress, morbidity, mortality and of course economic costs as well. There was quite a few analyses going on about the cost effectiveness of prevention rather than treatment. And I think a key issue is that there are many common drivers of the most important non-communicable diseases. So things like tobacco use, um, air pollution, uh, food system, actually drive lots of different types of illness and distress, cardiovascular, stroke, uh, mental health, uh, coronary heart disease. I think it was felt very strongly that we needed research which actually was solution focused, that is, it developed realistic, actionable, sustainable, all these words that come out, but they are important words, to NCD prevention rather than high theory on its own. And I think the funders in particular felt it was really important for different types of funding streams to come together to work together in this area. So the other bit of background um, was the National Prevention Research Initiative. This had four funding calls. It spent um, 34 million. It supported 74 research projects. But researchers were invited to put in proposals which focused on key individual behaviours, so alcohol, smoking, diet, and physical activity. And I think the funders felt it was a, a good um, initiative, but there was a review of how it had gone in 2015, and they felt very much that there needed to be um, a more upstream population-level population, population level, um, approach, that there needed to be work on the cost-effectiveness of any solutions. There was a lot of work which said, I'm sure this will work or this might work, but didn't say whether it was cost-effective, uh, what the opportunity costs were. Um, there was a major criticism was a lot of the work was descriptive or explanatory rather than actually looking at solving problems. And I think this is an issue which we're going to come back to. There was also an issue about actually really understanding the mechanisms of action of any proposed solutions. And finally, there was an issue about looking at um, health in terms of health inequalities. It's recognised a lot of individually focused health promotion activities can increase rather than reduce health inequalities, and it was felt important to take this into account. Another bit of background was the Academy of Medical Sciences report in 2016, which Anne shared, and I was a member of that group. Again, it really emphasised the importance of prevention research. It identified challenges and opportunities. It considered different environmental, so upstream um, environments which influence health and health behaviours. And the report's findings really reinforced the rationale post 
the National Prevention Research Initiative for the UK Prevention Research Programme, particularly the need for multidisciplinary approaches to population-based prevention activities. So the UK PRP is a response by multiple funders to the National Prevention Research Initiative, the realisation that was underfunding of prevention research and the AMS report. So you probably know the partnership has 12 partners and I think it's important to note that these are charities, both general charities and disease-specific charities, um, science funders in terms of UKRI councils, and also health and social care departments, so policy departments. Currently, there's a pot of over £50 million, which um, is expected to allocate over the next, next six to seven years. And, but one of the major points is that it's hoped that if the UK PRP is successful, it'll be an initiative that continues uh, way beyond that point. So what are the objectives? I'm not going to read all of these out, but the aim is to produce robust new knowledge about actionable, and this is really key, we want to know about solutions, strategies, whatever, that actually people can put into practice, which are cost-effective, uh, which are scalable um, nationally, regionally, etc., um, to improve population health and reduce inequalities in health. The idea is to have a substantial long-term investment, and one of the reasons for having call one and then call two was to really check out the portfolio and to be able to look at the investment over time. So, again, I would really emphasise the fact that it's solution-focused rather than uh, theory-focused. I mean, theory is important, but the point is we want answers to important questions. So other issues about the focus, I guess the window cleaner is having a good time out there because it's actually pouring with rain, so he's competing. There's rain coming, water coming down these windows, but it's, some of it's rain, some of it's window cleaner. So um, obviously prevention can apply to infectious diseases, but this initiative is about non-communicable diseases. This is because there's other funding streams for infectious diseases, not because they're not important. Um, Upstream population level determinants I've mentioned and primary, not secondary or tertiary prevention. I've also mentioned solving problems rather than describing them. Um, and I think there's issues about um, transferability of solutions, so context, different settings, different environments, improved targeting, uh, reducing health inequalities by a range of um, different characteristics. And I think one thing we didn't get in core one, but we are keen to emphasise, we're interested in evaluating existing strategies rather than just new ones. There might be things that governments or local authorities are doing which are expensive and useless, um, and it would be good to get evidence of that. So we are interested in existing initiatives. So... This is a slide I commissioned uh, many years ago, and it's just to emphasise the obvious point that actually it's better to stop pushing people in the river in the first place than to uh, try and get them out at the other end. It's much more efficient and it's much more um, better for people's well-being. Let's put it that way. Um, this is a slide from Boyd Swinburne, which is actually uh, focused on um, obesity, but it could be focused on other things, and I'm sure... Diane would say that we ought to have more feedback loops in this. It's a bit linear, but anyway. Basically, the point is that on the left, you have the very upstream uh, syst systemic drivers of obesity, and on the right, you have very individually focused ones. But I'd like to emphasise that the key point is the little wedge at the bottom. So basically, um, the population effect and political difficulty are higher on the left. More upstream things are difficult to get political buy-in, but they may be more effective. Things on the right, like bariatric surgery, may be effective for individuals but can't be um, used for the whole population, um, but they may be more politically acceptable. So we have to accept that going upstream may cause more political difficulty. So what are the features of the UK PRP? Um, one of them is interdisciplinarity. The funders are very keen to, and I know this inter, trans, multi, but just treat them as a big bag for the moment. Um, the UK PRP uh, is really keen to see interdisciplinary research. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all model of what this consists of. So basically, the partnership isn't prescriptive about you've got to have a so-and-so and a so-and-so. It's all about um, the need for that topic. 
So if you were developing and trialling new traffic control schemes, you might need to get traffic engineers on board, sustrans, town planners. If you're focusing on food systems, you might need to get uh, retail analysts uh, and food scientists on board. So it depends on your question what disciplines you have involved. The partnership is very keen for co-development, um, co-developing um, the projects and the ideas um, with partners. Partners are both the users of evidence in terms of implementers and the beneficiaries or potential beneficiaries of the work, uh, which may mean communities, the public in general, etc. Um, one issue is um, industry. The partnership is happy for you to collaborate with industry. But as you know, in the public health field, this can be a complete minefield and a no-no. So the partnership has actually developed guidelines for uh, collaborating with industry. And if anybody of you plan to uh, collaborate with industry, it's well worth discussing this and going through uh, what um, the, the guidelines are. Again, to co-development with users, it all depends on your question and your topic. So it isn't that you have to have this sort of user, you need to get the users who are appropriate to your topic. Methodological um, principles. We, we've had a lot of people in the first round said, oh, but do you allow this and can we do that? And oh, but they won't want qualitative work and they won't want this. Well, it's not true. Again, the, the methods must be appropriate to the research questions and the issues you're addressing. So they could be um, development and evaluation of new interventions or strategies, using natural experiments to evaluate um, existing um, uh, interventions, modelling, qualitative work. The funders are particularly keen to see the exploitation of new digital technologies and routine data, large-scale data sets, social media, etc. So again, just on the methodological approaches, it is important to remember that the the solution focus. So it's not to deeply understand or describe. That is only worth doing if you can come up with something which talks about solutions. Another key element is knowledge broker. Sorry, I keep looking around because I don't have a laptop, so I can't see what slides are going up. Um, knowledge transfer and exchange are going to be an integral part. It might be through the stakeholder relationships that people have used, developed right at the beginning to co-develop their research, or it might be new uh, methods of knowledge brokering and again the mechanisms need to be appropriate for the particular topic. Now I'll move on briefly to um, core one and this has been publicised you will have seen who got money in core one. I just want to really illustrate the topics rather than go through the details. So consortia which as you know is the sort of biggest um, longer term type of funding um, Four consortia awards uh, were given. Over £25 million was committed to the four consortia and the four networks between them. So the consortia covered urban planning and development, early life, unhealthy commodities and commercial determinants, and systems-based economic evaluation methods. The networks uh, cover school food systems, uh, maternal and child health using admin data, agent-based modelling and trade and investment agreements. So in thinking about call two, the partnership took into account what was funded in call one and obviously wanted to complement that. So I'm going to discuss briefly the particular priorities now for call two, but to emphasise that although these were identified as particular priorities, if you come up with something that doesn't meet these priorities but still meets the overall vision and objectives, that's absolutely fine. We're not restricting um, funding to these particular topics. So preventing poor mental health and promoting well-being. In, in call one, we got quite a few projects which said, and we'll look at a mental health element of this, but it was quite minor. Reducing health inequalities. Again, we got, this is our major focus, and by the way, we might look at health inequalities, but we really like to see work which directly attacks uh, mental health and or preventing mental health and inequalities. Fiscal and economic strategies, we'd be very keen to see. Other social and economic determinants, by which we mean welfare systems, social care, occupational settings, spaces and places, education, uh, those sorts of um, social and economic determinants. Tackling food systems, I mean, we're aware there is some work going on about food systems, but we'd be particularly keen to see 
uh, good applications in the field of food systems. And the other ones are targeting the urban environment, green and blue spaces, and specific life courses. Obviously, in phase one, we did have early life, but um, it might be interesting to see if there's anything in later life, uh, retirement transitions, etc. Now, people often ask what we're looking for um, and what good looks like. I mean, there's a few lessons from call one. And some of these are sort of motherhood and apple pie, and pretty obvious. When we're not terribly interested in very small, low prevalence um, uh, NCDs. We're interested in the important, high burden, high prevalence NCDs and important, uh, significant drivers of those NCDs. Um, the next one is even more, you all know this from putting in research applications. We want them to be realistic, ambitious, good value, and excellent research. Now, you might take that for granted. But in call one, what we found good, and I'll maybe concentrate on the negative, is what we want is what are you going to do? What specifically are you going to do? What concretely are you going to do or plan to do if you're funded? What is already known about this specific topic and what these activities will add? Um, what are the mechanisms, the theory of change, by which these activities are likely to affect changes in drivers of NCD. And then we need the appropriateness, as I've mentioned before, of the methods, the partners, um, the disciplines, etc., and the knowledge brokering plans. What good looks like is actually very similar across both consortia and networks, um, although the goals and activities of these two funding streams different. Essentially, what the expert review group is going to be looking at is whether applicants actually answer the exam question and are as concrete and explicit as possible. We don't want you to say, we're going to conduct um, paradigm shifting, ground baking, cutting edge, excellent research, which will have a huge impact, but we're not quite sure what we're going to do. And, but I mean, we did actually get in call one, um, when we asked uh, what's your, what are the mechanisms or what is known about your topic, we got people saying, oh, it's a huge burden of um, non-communicable diseases and prevention is really important. We said, yes, we told you that. We don't want to know that. We want to know for your topic, what is the most up-to-date recent knowledge about it? And for the mechanisms of action, the theory of change, what for your topic is known, or what do you hypothesize to be how this is going to work? So we really want you to be as explicit and concrete as possible. Obviously, particularly with consortia, if you're talking about five years, you can't specify what you're going to do exactly in year four. It might depend on earlier. But we do want you to be as concrete as possible. The bottom line, there's two bottom lines, we want to be able to say, wow, if they can pull this off, and it's likely they can, this will make a good impact. That will make us think this is what good looks like, this is what we'll fund. The other thing is I would be able to go on today and say uh, to the press uh, to pass on to taxpayers and to charitable givers that this is a really important topic and this um, consortium or network is really going to be able to address it.